Having crucial, critical, constructive conversations can be challenging for all of us. Today, we'll discuss how to make those easier. My name is Matt Abrahams, and I teach strategic communication at Stanford Graduate School of Business. Welcome to Think Fast, Talk Smart, the podcast. Today, I'm super excited to chat with Irv Grosbeck. Irv was the co-founder and co-director of the GSB Center for Entrepreneurial Studies, which he helped run for 20 years. And he is the co-author of the textbook, New Business Ventures and the Entrepreneur. He teaches conversations in management for the GSB, and for 10 years, he taught managing difficult conversations at the Stanford Medical School. He co-founded Continental Cable Vision, later called Media One. He serves on numerous boards and is an owner of the Boston Celtics professional basketball team. Irv, thanks so much for joining me. I am super excited for our conversation. Well, Matt, thanks for asking me. It's a treat to be here. Yeah. Shall we get started? Let's do. Excellent. Irv, what do you say to somebody who says, you know, why do I need to work on this crucial conversation stuff? I'm pretty good at communicating as it is. Well, Matt, uh, an entrepreneur to our way of thinking is someone who is looking for opportunity without regard to the resources that he or she currently controls. So, so many people think, gosh, I don't have much money. I'm going to wait some time. I'm going to build up a little money and then I'll be able to find some a business to start or buy and invest in. And I'm not going to do that now. And then time passes by. And if they think about it, that they aren't the capital supplier, they're just the opportunity finder. Mm. Then the second key to me is to be sure that you get comfortable with the domain that you're in. Now, what's a domain? It's healthcare is not a domain. It's a whole aggregation of domains. But back office support for hospitals is a domain. So there's an old adage that we like to remind students about, which is when great management meets a bad business, the business always wins. I love that idea of being an opportunity finder and looking for the right domains. And I think that applies not just to entrepreneurship, but often in daily life and in the decisions we make. Indeed. What are myths or counterintuitive ideas that you want people to know about entrepreneurship? Well, there's a common perception that still lingers among many people that Entrepreneurs are a certain personality type. They're bombastic and they <laughs> are attracted to risk and they're egotistical and they just sort of swagger around and that's the way they operate. And indeed, the best entrepreneurs are antithetical to that. Uh, they are thoughtful people who try to shrink every possible modicum of risk out of what they're doing, and further, to be sure the risk they must assume or choose to assume is execution sensitive rather than what the economists would call exogenous or uncontrollable. Do you think entrepreneurs are born or can they be made? No question in my mind that they uh, a lot of people think 300 hitters in baseball are born, but boy, some of them get there by hard work. And that's how I feel about entrepreneurs. I had no idea I would be an entrepreneur. Um, I wasn't exposed to any growing up. I didn't even understand or think about that path. So was it in me all the time? I don't know, but I'd rather suspect not. But I, I came to it. And I think so many of our students I've tracked over the years feel the same way. I believe that all of us can become more entrepreneurial uh, if we allow ourselves and we surround ourselves with the opportunities and the people who can help. Yes, sir. Exactly. You teach courses both at the Graduate School of Business and the Stanford Medical School where you used to teach that help students with challenging situations. Of all the various communication challenges you work on with your students, what is one that is most difficult for them to handle? And what coaching do you provide them to help them with that? So I think a difficult one is 
when they are in a tough conversation and new information comes to light, mm -hmm. they don't change position mm -hmm. because they worry about how they look. Mm -hmm. And indeed, if they think about serving the organization, uh, they need to change position. And if it's too hard to change position right there on the spot, the next important thing to do is to tell the person, let's take a deep breath here. I need to reflect on this new information. Let's meet tomorrow at 9 o'clock and continue this conversation. So certainly changing position is difficult, difficult for all of us, but particularly difficult starting out when many students as entrepreneurs have the imposter syndrome. What am I doing here? Can I do it? Do I really belong? How do I look? And so it's really tough. A second one is really hard for students to be brief. Mm -hmm especially when they're uncertain and nervous about the context and the person on the other side of the desk and what they're saying. They tend to be elliptical, to repeat themselves, just to go on and on. You know, brevity conveys conviction. And so getting them to say it in a third of the words is something we often ask them during class. And finally, I would say it's really hard for students not to make difficult conversations partly all about them or, or all about them rather than all about the other person. Difficult conversations are really very little about the person who's the initiator of the conversation in most cases. It, it might be how you feel about a situation, but then you'd go on to talk about the situation and the remediation and focusing on the issue and the other person and his or her needs is counterintuitive. Those are three really important bits of advice that you gave, that we, we have to not allow our entrenched or previous position to lock us into a way of thinking, especially when new information comes uh, to us. Brevity demonstrating conviction, I think everybody needs to take a moment and think about uh, being focused, being concise and clear or critical, and allowing ourselves to be other focused rather than self focused exactly. in these critical conversations is is so important. Thank you for sharing those three. You mentioned the notion of imposter syndrome, and I'd, I'd love to get your perspective on that. A lot of people listening in, myself included, I have, have times or bouts of imposter syndrome how do you help people think about that and perhaps avoid falling into that trap? Well, um, I, I don't spend a lot of time talking with them about that, but on right. the occasions that I have, I've simply said, you're well qualified to be in the position you're in. The reason you feel that way may be that you haven't done it before, mm. but you're in a position to do it. And so dig in and do the best you can, and that will most oftentimes be sufficient. I think that notion that novelty plays a lot into it. This is the first time I've done this, or I, I don't have that experience to rely on. And reminding yourself that, that that's okay, and in fact, the opportunity is there because of the successes and traits that you demonstrate. Yeah, it's okay and it's normal. Yeah. It's normal to feel that way. That's right. Uh, many of us can be in environments where we feel like we're the only one experiencing that. And in fact, many people are. Right. Many of the topics that you teach your students uh, can be very provocative and anxiety provoking. How do you help your students manage those various communication situations that you present them with? What, what skills do you bolster or build in them to help them handle these situations? So our students... Uh, we're lucky enough to be teaching smart students. Mm -hmm. And if you tee up a problem and uh, ask the students to give you a few, uh, give, give you an answer, some answers to how that problem might be solved, they'll probably come up with pretty good answers despite their lack of experience. They're, they're thoughtful, smart, they figure things out on the fly. And so they come up with a good answer. And then you say, well, um, 
that involves talking to so-and-so. Yep. So how would you begin that conversation? Hmm. Then is when the shutters come down and the blank looks appear. <laughs> it's so hard to translate recommendations into effective action. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you how many students, because they're nervous, and by the way, I would have done the same when I was in my late 20s and an MBA student, so it's normal. Um, many students say, they start the conversation, hey, how was your weekend? <laughs> well, you know, that doesn't set quite the right tone. This isn't a jolly social conversation. This is serious stuff that we want to work on together. And so helping them start that conversation, once they get into it, they can probably get going. But setting the tone, setting the first few things you're going to say uh, is really helpful for them. Commencing is important, and it's hard for many of us. Do you have specific ways you like to suggest that people start these challenging situations, certain words or phrases or just uh, things to think about that could give us guidance? The magic word in many of these conversations is we. Mm -hmm. If you can have a difficult conversation in which both you and the other person are looking together at the problem or set of issues and trying to find a solution that works for both parties, it makes it non-adversarial or at least lowers the temperature as opposed to, look, you're missing quota. You, if you don't do better, I mean, some students start out boldly an underperforming salesperson. You're missing quota, you've got to do better, or we'll have to let you go. Really, I mean, if I knew, let's assume as a salesperson, if I knew how to do it, I would have already done it. I right. need help. Right. As opposed to, I want to work with you to get you to a level where I know you can uh, reach, that I know you can reach. Um, Obvious, and I want to work with you consistently over the next two months. It'll be obvious both to you and me whether we're successful together, and I think we will be. If not, we'll have to part ways, but I don't expect that to happen. Well, that's a conversation that is a shot across the bow, mm -hmm. but it also says I'm going to work shoulder to shoulder with you as opposed to go out there and do better. Absolutely. It's, it's very collaborative and inclusive and, and using words like we and us can be very helpful to that. Yes. It sounds like you and I have a similar approach to, to these situations where we need to see them as opportunities to problem solve through collaboration versus just declarations. Uh, and, and it can really make a big difference. I know you use role playing as a means to teach the skills that you teach and helping people to deal with these difficult conversations. Would you be willing to put me through one of these role plays and coach me uh, as if I were one of your students? I'd love to work on uh, these situations myself. Oh, good. Well, we'll have some fun. Excellent. Let's do it. So you are Sarah Wilsey, athletic director of the fictitious National University. Mm-hmm. You manage 32 sports. You have a team of 60, excluding the coaches. You have four associate athletic directors, of which I, Tom Steele, am one. Mm -hmm. So I had a successful career. I'm a mid-career person. I had a successful career as a Division Three athletic director, and I came to National some years ago as an associate athletic director, working for your predecessor, hoping to find a Division I AD job. So far, I haven't found one. Your position became open a year ago, and I applied for it, mm -hmm. but I lost the position in favor of you. And uh, so you, the athletic director, have received three independent reports from people in your group whom you respect, separate reports. Two were from other associate athletic directors, 
And one was from a very up and coming and thoughtful younger person who's, who's really got great potential. And those reports all say that I'm bad mouthing you behind your back. I'm criticizing you. I'm criticizing your decisions and I'm a real negative influence around here. And so you've gone to your executive coach and said, what do I do? And the executive coach says, you have to have a conversation with Matt, with uh, Tom Steele. And so you're Sarah and I'm Tom. Hmm. You, you don't joke around. Irv. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a potent uh, situation. I, I'm, I'm questioning my, my desire to do this. Um, so you would like for me to role play with you how I might bring forth these this information that I've learned about what's happening behind my back. And what you're going to do about it. You, you can't. So this is a puncture in the culture. Yes. At GSB, we talk an awful lot about culture, mm -hmm. and we talk about the leader of the organization being the culture carrier. Mm -hmm. Part of that responsibility is to repair punctures in the culture. Now mm -hmm. is your time. So I would be thinking about going into this situation. I would be thinking about what's my objective, and my objective is at least in two directions. One, I want to make it very clear that uh, this is causing issues within the culture. And second, I want to make it clear that I am here in support of Tom, but that the expectation is that, that Tom will be supportive of the culture, and if there are issues that he has with me or the organization, that he will bring them up. So I'm trying to align my communication to that goal. It's a perfect summary of your goals. Good. Yes. We're off to a good start. <laughs> thank you. So I'd like to, Tom, thank you. It's come to my attention that there are circumstances in which you are expressing concern about the way I'm doing things. As you well know, Part of my wait. Who told you that? These are. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we we have a very open culture here, and I expect and ask for people to give me feedback and insight into what's working and what's not working. And several in the organization have presented to me conversations where they have heard you talk about disagreeing with, or in some cases, actually insulting my actions and the things that I'm saying. We mean I don't get to know who my accusers are? This is a sort of a blindside. I don't understand this. Well, I'm surprised that you see this as a blindside. We have a culture here where you and I give each other feedback all the time. My goal here is for us to focus on the relationship you and I have and the role that you fulfill within this organization and the impact that your thoughts and actions have. And together, I believe we can come up with a way to not only help you voice your ideas and opinions in a way that I can hear them and direct, but also to continue the culture that we together are building. I think you're doing a great job, and, and I actually don't know what you're talking about. Well, to me, I've heard in a few instances that when we talked about our new program to offer uh, further education for some of our new uh, members of our team, that you thought that that was a waste of time, that they would learn most by being on the job. And I'd love for you to bring those ideas forward so that we can have a discussion, because I think there is some value in people learning on the job, but we need to bolster them with some skills. And I think together we can have a good conversation about that. And I'd appreciate in the future you and I working together when there are ideas that you have or disagreements that can help us. Okay, okay, I understand. Well. <clears throat> I want to make one thing clear. Never, ever have I criticized you personally. Now, as far as the education initiative goes, you remember that when we discussed it in advance, I didn't think it was a good idea. And yet it was put into place. And so I've simply commented that I didn't agree with the decision. I mean, I don't, I don't understand exactly why isn't that normal? It is absolutely normal and appropriate to share opinions and ideas. The tone and timing of those opinions are important, and then they can convey information. As a respected leader on this team, you and all of us in the leadership role need to be very thoughtful about when we voice our concerns and opinions. 
and the tone in which we do that. We are role modeling at all times the culture that we want to be. And I have seen you in several circumstances support and reinforce the culture that we have. And I simply ask that in times where you have some disagreement, that we find the appropriate form and appropriate way to voice those. I hope that you feel comfortable bringing those to me, and I hope that you feel comfortable sharing your opinion. I just want to make sure that we don't create an adversarial relationship, because I am fully supportive of the work you do for us, and I have seen the value that you bring to this organization. Okay. Well, I understand, and I, I'm in agreement with that. I I guess my lips are sealed after the decision. Um, regardless of how I feel about it, I'll have to suppress my views. I certainly don't want anybody on this team suppressing their views, but I do want us to be all thoughtful about how our views and how we communicate those views might have a broader impact. Great. Wow, you are good, or um, I, I am sweating as we have this huh. conversation. Share with me, uh, I know feedback is an important thing that you uh, provide your students. Share with me the feedback about how I did or the things that I could do differently or better. I'd love to learn uh, as your students do from you. I thought you were extraordinary. I thought it was very polished yet substantive. Uh, what I might have added, uh, uh, and of course, this is this is an actual vignette we teach in class. Yes, um, a couple of things I would have added. Sure, uh, but I thought what you said stands on its own. Those additions would include um, if I kept denying, which I I did once. Right. I would say I use a phrase like, "Well, we need to get past denial and mm. talk about the future." Mm -hmm. um, so. Please bring your disagreement after the decision is made only to me. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it looks like bad-mouthing the decision and maybe me, even though I know that's not your intent. Mm -hmm. And then you could have added in at the very end, and this is kind of frosting on the cake. Uh, look, Tom, there's a lot for us to gain by fully closing ranks and going forward together. I want and need your support. Uh, I think I'm in a position to support you in your own career goals of becoming a Division I athletic director. I hear of a lot of opportunities and openings. Mm -hmm. I'm in a position to tell you about them and also to write you letters of referral. I can't do that unless we're working together. So you're really at a crossroads here. I hope we can close ranks. I do respect you. You add a lot of value here. If we can't close ranks, it's going to be necessary to part ways. Thank you for that feedback and not just giving the feedback, but giving examples as well, which I think is really helpful for me and for others when we give concrete examples of what we're saying versus generalities. I really take to heart that notion of naming the behavior that I'm seeing. I, in our conversation, was purposefully not naming some of the things because I, I was trying not to make the person defensive. Uh, if I were to say denial, I felt that might be cause the person to be defensive. But in hearing how you said it, I actually see how it actually punctuates the point. And that's helpful information. And that coming to the end of the, the conversation and being very clear about what's needed, closing the ranks, and the fact that I can support you, but if this doesn't work, we might have to reevaluate. Re Very helpful. And that's going to change the way I think in some of the interactions I have. So oh, I appreciate okay. that. That's a compliment, and I accept it with thanks. <laughs> Excellent. We've talked a lot about talking and what we say. I'm curious to get your opinion on listening. What's the value of listening in these crucial conversations? And what advice do you have to help people listen better? I often... Uh compare persuading, which is an essential quality of leadership, with salesmanship, with mm. selling. Mm -hmm. And no one ever bought anything while you were talking. So uh, uh, it, it just seems to me that say what you're going to say and pause. It show Pauses show respect. Mm-hmm. They show respect in two ways. They show respect that I, 
I want to hear what you want to say. And two is, I want to stop talking and I don't wish to dominate this conversation. So it's really important to be not only brief, but to stop. And open space is really the ally of the person conducting the conversation. We often talk about listening as getting the information you need so that you can process and then communicate. But listening, as you've just shared, demonstrates openness, demonstrates a willingness to listen, and seating the floor and showing, I value what you have to say. So it is a demonstrative act, not just an act of, of gaining information exactly. and insight. And I appreciate that. And, and I think all of us need to allow a little more space for others to share. Right. We are a careers podcast, and I know you have advice for people who are choosing careers or considering changing careers. What career guidance can you share with our listeners? So I think there's one, of course, a lot of it is the specifics of their situation, but there's one common thread that I share, and it's not data-based. It's experiential, partly from looking back at what I see in, in my own career and those I've known over the years, but also in students. And that is that the, I think in terms of paths, and I often say to the student, I know this is a daunting question and you don't need to answer it now, but it might be useful to go back and think about where you'd like to be in 10 years. And when I say where you'd like to be, I'm thinking as much about context as I am about domain or sub-industry. I'm thinking, do you want to be in charge? Do you want to be one of several partners in charge? Do you want to visualize that you might be not in charge, but a valuable contributor? Um, do you think you're and where are you on the river between operator, which side of the river are you on, operator or advisor? Are you a consultant, investment banker, commercial banker, other advisor, or are you running a business or part of a business? So that, that first divide or that first decision is one that many of our students have not made yet. Um, part of it is because they've had experience on one side of the river, which may have been pretty good or not so good, and they might want to try the other side of the river. But thinking about context is particularly useful because it rules out part of the world. Well, I, I think I want to be, I don't think I necessarily want to be the managing partner, but I'd like to be a partner. I'd like to have a good managing partner and so forth. Well, Wow, that you've just ruled out enormous parts of the world. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> if you can come up with two or three things that are not only contexts, but possibly sets of activities that mm -hmm. point toward domains, and then you can now come back to where you are and say, what are logical paths to get there? What do I need to do to get there? So if I think I want to be on the operating side of the river, just to use an example, we could use the other side as well, but if I want to be on the operating side of the river, it's not very useful for me right now unless it's a compelling economic proposal. They've sent me to school and I go back for two years and it's repaid. In the absence of that, it's not useful for me to get more analytical experience. You know, I'm actually a good analyst already. I was a good analyst begot before I got to business school. Now I'm e an even better analyst. Do I need to be do more analysis? No. What do I need to do to be an operator? Well, how about I get into some sort of operating position where I have to do some work of a certain quality and produce it in a certain time frame, or perhaps over a short period of time, I get to hire some people and supervise them. So let's not go over to the other side if we don't want to be on that side and we've already been on it for a long time. Yet it's amazing how many people 
take what they perceive to be the safe route. Mm -hmm. But for the first time, perversely in their careers, there is no safe route. Mm -hmm. There are risks at whatever they choose. There was no risk in what college they went to. They got to go to any one of four wonderful colleges. Same with business school, most likely. Same with the jobs in between. Now, oh my, if I go here, I'm not here, and the opportunity cost is great. This idea of thinking about the future and considering the context to help us make decisions, so many of us play to our strengths and our comfort zone. And the advice you're giving us is, is to take ourselves out of that and look and be more strategic. Exactly. And I think all of us in our careers, regardless of what phase we're in, could benefit from that. So, Irv, as we close, uh, I'd like to ask you three questions. One I make up just for you and two I ask all my guests. Are you up for that? I am. Uh, I and others benefit from the choice you've made to be a teacher. Thank you for that work. As a teacher myself, I know that while we impart lots of information, we also learn a tremendous amount from our students. I'm curious, what is something you've learned or continue to learn from your students that, that you find helpful uh, and impactful for you? I'm constantly reminded uh, by our students uh, to be careful in the words I choose, irrespective of how supposedly good at this I am. Um, I'm always trying to be better and to choose a better word or a better tone or better phrasing, be more sensitive. They constantly remind me to be that way. Some of their reminders are negative examples, but amazingly, and one of the attractions of teaching is that I actually learn a lot from their phrasing occasionally and their sensitivity. I got an email the other day from a student with a little sort of reminder, if you will, at the bottom, um, try to be kind whenever it's possible, dash, it's always possible. <laughs> the, the language, the tone are, are really important, and our students can help us to, to enhance what we do and to help us be more reflective. And I think focusing on language and tone in all communication is, is critical. I'm curious, sir, for our second question, who is a communicator that you admire and why? I'm a great Warren Buffett fan. Mm -hmm. I think Warren Buffett has all of the elements of a great communicator. He can be whimsical, light. He's always got a lot of content. He's direct. Now, have I seen him in a lot of difficult conversations? No, a few where shareholders ask barbed questions from the floor, but not very many. So do I know that he's an expert communicator in, in difficult conversations? No, but he, I think I admire him greatly. I think he, I come away from those conversations thinking, boy, what a nice person he is, how smart he is, and how thoughtful he is about new things that he says. I picked up a phrase maybe a year or two ago that he said, we should always be redefining the edge of our competence. And I believe that's true. What a wonderful idea. And I think that the, this podcast is trying to help people and myself do, do that. Uh, Warren Buffett clearly has a style that is very uh, approachable, yet you, you absolutely do not question his credibility. And, and that, that's a hard mix to, to manage. Final question for you. What are the first three ingredients that go into a successful communication recipe? So my first three are, and, and I hope I can add a coda to the first three, <laughs> but the first three are directness with respect. Mm -hmm. So many of our students feel quite properly that, or properly in their minds, that um, if you're direct with someone, somehow that's harsh or you're not being sensitive. The art of good conversation management, I think, does involve directness and respect at the same time. They can go hand in hand, but it takes work. 
The second would be strength with warmth. Hmm. And by strength, I don't mean power. I mean decisiveness. Um, but I, I want to convey my decisiveness not like I'm putting down a fiat that they have to follow, hmm. but that this is the path that makes the most sense, and I'd be glad to talk with them about it, any reservations they have. I'm soliciting their support for it, and I respect what they've done. I think that those two can go hand in hand, and that is definitely something that the students resist at first. It's hard for them to comprehend, and I appreciate that. The second, the third one is um, is interesting, and I, I learned this at the medical school. Don't mistake vagueness for compassion. Mm. Being vague with somebody is actually not being compassionate. And that's particularly true in medical situations where they really want to know where they stand and they deserve to know where they stand in the kindest way, as opposed to coming away with sort of a hopeful thought that, well, here's what the doctor said, when in fact that isn't what the doctor intended to say. That's true in business settings as well. My codas, that w both of which we've talked about, are brevity and pauses. Mm -hmm. I just think they're, they're really important to think as you talk uh, to be brief. I think of conversation, difficult conversation management as a performance art. Mm -hmm. Even at this stage, I don't go into a difficult conversation unless I've actually said the words in advance. I have talking points. Talking points do not suffice. I, it's a practice art. I'm not going to go out and play the violin in front of people unless I pretty well have the piece rehearsed. Well, that's also true of difficult conversations. And finally, it's amazing how much you can anticipate what the other person would say and be prepared for those responses. So much richness there. The three ingredients you shared, to me, all are founded on this notion of many of us want to be nice and kind, and sometimes that impacts what we really need to do in the circumstance. We need to have strength. We need to uh, make sure that we are clear and and that is doing a dis we're doing a disservice to those we speak to if we don't lead with those ingredients brevity and pausing absolutely critical and i'll end by simply saying i 100 percent agree communication is something you have to practice it's not just talking points it's not just thinking through things in your head you actually have to practice the words coming out of your mouth before you enter into the situation irv this has been fantastic Thank you for your master class on communication. It's been a pleasure, Matt. You're doing great work here. Thank you for including me. Thank you.